Maybe we make a little speed round in the beginning, starting with uh, Mr. Blackshaw. What is your first impression uh, this year here in Colonia de Mexico? Fabulous. I had a great jog this morning, great crowd, uh, and uh, everyone I've talked to said this is the biggest show in, uh, in Europe. And, on Earth. Uh, on Earth. <laughs> on Earth. Excuse on Earth. me. <laughs> Galaxy. <laughs> What's your first impression? It's, it's enormous, and, uh, and now I finally understand where 20% of my budget is going. <laughs> but uh, the fact that I had to get out halfway on the bridge to walk here was a good sign of how busy it was. And I tell you, it could be even more of your budget. <laughs> We're going to talk about that later on. What's your first impression? Uh, I think this is a great event. Uh, it's much bigger than I knew before I was invited, um, and, and I've been impressed by that. And I'm also impressed just the diversity of people who come together uh, from all different parts of the industry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's actually reading all the time about how the global economy is in, in great turmoil. It, this, it's clear that the digital economy is, uh, continues to grow and, and, and growing very fast. Mr. Moore. Uh, long lines and uh, too many men, not enough women. <laughs> <laughs> how are we going to change that? We need your support. Maybe, maybe. You have 100% of my support. Okay, <laughs> even that topic, yeah? Okay, we'll work on that. <laughs> Mr. Zygalovic. Well, uh, it's huge, probably the hugest event I've, uh, I've ever visited. So it's, it's really, it's nice, beautiful, huge. A little bit too formal to me. Eh? But, but you, you start <laughs> to break that rule, okay? Well, I usually go to technology and, uh, and more like informal events, and this is... Is, is this one of the main differences already between uh, Russia and the digital market and uh, maybe Germany, UK, France, Benelux? What do you think? I don't think there is a kind of a structural difference. I think it's pretty much the same, but of course the level of uh, uh, the advantage and the, the level of uh, professionalism and uh, the shine is much higher here. The shine. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about what do you mean with the shine? <laughs> well, everyone was talking about that. I mean, everyone was kind of impressed by what is here. So I, I'm impressed too. So I'm not... Actually, we are very impressed uh, to see what are you doing there in Russia because uh, the most of you, of course, know Yandex. Um, I think there are just only two markets in the world where Google is not number one. It's um, China and it's it's Russia and uh, uh, Mr. Sigalovich. I, th I think I think Korea and also Czech Republic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I know what you mean with shine. Eh? Okay. So, but let me say the big markets and um, just start with that before we really go into the digital transformation, shaping models, creating business. What is our topic today? Um, what is the secret of your success in Russia? Simple. We we are consistent. We started very early, earlier than Google, and we've been working hard. We've been uh, providing better services and a wider range of services long before any international companies could penetrate Russian market. So we stayed uh, alive, didn't give up. This is the second. That's it. And the colleagues of Google, they are still watching and say. Oh, Segalovich, he has the market, let's, uh, let's okay. go against Google all the other part of the world. They're a great company, but uh, in Russia they're at a distant second. And uh, it's also very good for, for Russia to have uh, two strong players. So we have lots of services launched uh, quite early. And we have, uh, because of that competition, we have uh, a really, really good atmosphere and good ecosystem. If we're talking about um, shaping models, creating um, business, um, maybe we start uh, with um, Roland Devant, Vice President of Marketing, Sales and Services, Ford. You just mentioned the key word, the magic word, budget. I think you, you brought something along. Um, you've got something to show how you're going to spend the money and uh, maybe talk a little bit about that before. Yeah, well, we, we think that online is a great opportunity uh, for us because it allows us to talk with the audience uh, in a much more uh, specific and detailed way. Uh, we're trying to break through on technology, and in a normal, conservative, normal ad, you can't just get all that content out. And that's where we're using digital 
uh, because it allows us to get customers to the web, to get some uh, apps on the iPad, and, and get that very complicated story about all these new features out. Uh, and I've got some examples uh, brought with me um, to just demonstrate how we do that. And in fact, in most cases, we do that by allowing the public to design that content. So they speak to the audience. You have something, we're going to show it right here. You got some slides, I well, guess. Well, uh, there's a little video of something that, uh, that actually uh, we, we had a contest. The only reward was that we would make that film. Uh, so I'll show you what that was. Hello, I am Marco Sierra and this is the Gormelser Rangers. I have made for Ford a Reverb Challenge out of the Ford Domino Challenge. Es gibt eine neue Technologie von Ford, Active City Storm. Dabei bremst ein Ford die langsame Stadtverkehr automatisch ab, sobald das vorherfahrende Auto unerwartet stehen bleibt. Aber was passiert, wenn wirklich viele solche Autos hintereinander fahren und der erste Fahrer bremst plötzlich? Bremsen dann wirklich alle automatisch ab? Schauen wir mal. to come to life, uh, and this kind of thing, typically what we see is it doubles our Facebook likes, uh, for example. Uh, a film like this would have had uh, two and a half million views, and uh, that's something that advertising is very difficult to achieve those numbers on those budgets. You don't play that on television? You just do that It's only digital. digital. And uh, with social media, do you really get more for less? I think you get different. Um, because, uh, as I said, an ad, you can launch a car, you can go still, television is very important. You want to get that new out there. Uh, but then, uh, these days, there's so much to say, you cannot do that on television. So that's when you uh, start to work with digital to get that content out. But what we do also is what we call pre-launch. Uh, and a good example is the BMAX. It's a car that we're about to launch. But we started in January already uh, with putting that online with all kinds of engagements. In fact, we launched that on the Mobile World Congress. We didn't go to an auto show, we did go to the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona um, to talk about all the high tech. And we already have now 100,000 customers who have built online their preferred car, how they would want to buy it, what the price is, and haven't seen it even yet. This is a question to both of you, um, to Nestle and to, to Ford. Uh, what has to happen next that you increase your online media spendings? Well, for me, for oh, um, so I had uh, global uh, digital and, um, and social media based in Veve, and just as backdrop, we sell about 1.2 billion products a day, and translation to social, we're at about we're approaching about 100 million fans on Facebook across about 800. Uh, different pages, and we've seen about 25% growth just since uh, July, which just gives you a sense of how uh, things are moving. We fervently believe that getting it right in digital, enabling the transformation, uh, depends in part on staying very, very close to your fundamentals. You know, we have a brand building uh, framework at Nestle, brand building the Nestle way, which I have put a lot of focus on in terms of helping brand builders understand that. Digital and social is a very powerful vitamin to kind of take that to the next level. Uh, for example, in our toolkit, you know, one of our brand building houses is called Creating Engaging Brand Experiences. What could be more engaging than social media or digital? Now, as we think about the digital transformation, we have three primary pillars, and we've really been disciplined around them. Listening, engaging, and inspiring and transforming. The listening piece is how we listen to early signals in the marketplace, whether it's online conversations, search queries, uh, where people go on websites, and really trying to get a sense of what are the big unmet opportunities, unarticulated needs for consumers. The engaging piece is, I think, a real challenge for FMCG, CPG companies. This is 
almost like a democratization of CRM, where we suddenly have to engage with consumers. And this isn't really our comfort zone, but we're building a lot of discipline around getting that right. And the third piece is around uh, transforming and inspiring, which is really about organizational change. How do you build a flatter organization? How do you give more life to informal power? And if you run a very, very quick video, I'll give you a sense of, just a quick snapshot of how we're approaching it at the organizational design perspective. This is a program we just launched to really infuse digital culture across the globe. It's hosted in our headquarters. So you're going to see this video from Pete Blackshaw. the Digital Acceleration Team in Bebe. My name is Hannah Loa Grams and I'm the Program Manager. We are here to support brands, SBUs, markets and zone initiatives to help them to achieve and to accelerate their digital roadmaps. While we're doing this, we're working around our three core disciplines. Those are listening, engaging, inspiring and transforming. Our first team has been chosen based on digital background and appetite and was made of brand and digital managers and digital corporate communication people. Each team is staying in Bebe for eight months. During this stay, they experience hands-on brand community management, they are involved in strategic digital and social projects, and they run through an intense training program around our three core disciplines. We hope to see you soon here. Thank you very much. The last, um, the last word here is that um, I think the opportunity for us, not just Nestle but beyond, is how we fuse the social network within our own companies. Nestle is a radically decentralized company, but there are unbelievable learnings from all corners of the globe. I dare say that Nest, uh, Nestle India, for example, is leading the charge in community management. Well, Nestle USA, Gerber, is really taking CRM to the next level. How does the digital leader stitch that together? Not centralize, but circulate. That's our challenge. Almost how do you replicate them, all the things that we love in the external social networks internally? That's how we inspire management to drive change. That's how you ultimately bring new thinking about you know, driving more media efficiency and the like. Um, this uh, DAT project, uh to inspire us a little bit, because inspiration was one of the key words, yeah. um, how big is the investment of Nestle for that project? Well, the biggest investment is that our markets fund mission candidates, which means that they fund the entire cost of someone coming from China or India to spend eight months in our center. We co-invest a little bit. We obviously created a startup environment, you know, kind of our version of Silicon Valley, not quite like that, but we kind of created some new rules, um, so there was investment there. But the, um, but the most important thing is the markets. The markets invest in putting people in the center. We um, stimulate them, you know, we energize them, we educate them, they push out, and there's a lot of circulation of learning that takes place. And here's my question again from the beginning to both of you. Um, what, what has to happen next that you increase your online media spending? What has to happen? Yeah. I think, you know, for us, it's, um, you know, we're putting a lot of emphasis on how we uh, drive better synergies between paid, owned, and earned. I think one of the first things we need to do is how do you optimize your existing investments through digital? I think that's the low-hanging fruit. Um, I think you need to get rigorous as heck on measurements. I do think the measurements will guide us to very practical and obvious solutions. And the good news today is that measurements are everywhere. It's harder to pick the right KEIs, but there's no shortage of data that we can leverage to make those right decisions. I can give you a very tangible example of where we think we will spend more, uh, and that's mobile. The mobile and retail is becoming so important, and in the U.S. there are examples of, of retailers who uh, virtually gone out of business, went out of business because they didn't get it right. Um, we know that uh, the majority of our customers, they even in the dealerships, they're still checking what they see online. 
Uh, and we know that when they use their mobile phones, that in the majority of cases, an action follows. So mobile is much closer to action <laughs> than any other engagement uh, in communications. So mobile, uh, I've got a couple of statistics for you. Uh, I, the one I like most is that 9% of people check their mobile phone five times or more during the night. That's how powerful it is. Uh, we got a question here from the audience from uh, Simon uh, Morris. Um, how much of your marketing budget goes toward social media marketing? I think it's a question to uh, Mr. Yes. Blackshaw, Mr. DeWard. Does someone else want to tackle it before I have the space? But we can maybe start with you. I think it's a question. Well, social comes from a you. lot of different angles. I mean, I report both the marketing and corporate communication. There's a whole social endeavor on the corporate communication side. In fact, it's very difficult to decouple good old-fashioned media relations from social media today. So obviously, some of that budget's going there. And on the marketing side, social's being touched by the sales budget. I mean, all to, to, to your point about mobile, I think that's a big area. And obviously a growing percentage is coming on the marketing side. I wouldn't say there's a magic number, but there's no question that uh, social is, um, you know, social is kind of pervading everything, I believe. Maybe Simon wants to have a little bit more concrete. <laughs> I don't know what Simon well, is. I don't have a concrete answer. I can tell you that, uh, you know, new positions, uh, new programs, uh, if you look at you know all the advertising that's going on in platforms like Facebook or other places, you know there's a significant step up investment. Simon, sorry for that. What do you can answer to that question? How much Give of your marketing budget goes towards social media marketing? Well, I promised myself I would only give the 20% plus uh, goes to digital uh, today, and otherwise I'm not going to inform my competitors. Uh, what I think what what uh, the trend will be is that social grows because of one very powerful statistic. It is that the customers increasingly don't trust uh, the manufacturer as a messenger. Uh, they trust each other much more. In fact, they trust people they don't know at all, online, more than the manufacturers. Uh, so social is one of the most powerful and credible uh, ways to get trust and, uh, and value of what otherwise is just another claim from another manufacturer. We had a panel called The Digital Transformation, and Harvey Gold has um, digital intelligence delivers more data than uh, any client can evaluate. Do we already have a data overflow? I don't think it's overflow. I think it's, it's about putting the pieces together. Um, at the end of the day, what we do is we create consumer experiences on behalf of our clients. And what data allows us to do is contact and recontact customers and consumers of our clients on an ongoing basis and to have more knowledge and insight about those communication. Um, we've spent a lot of time, we've put a lot of investment behind our data. Um, you asked the question of what does it take to increase investments and where do we go from here? Um, I had a CMO about a year and a half ago, she called me up and she said, uh, I want to put more money into digital but I'm not comfortable because my retailers are important to me as, you know, as a key constituent. And if my retailers deal and I take money out of TV, which is what they're historically used to see, um, I may have a sales problem. And the first thing we did was actually go back to the data. So, so she had the confidence. And then the next thing we did is we put a team of measurement onto the business. We showed them, um, as we were executing the plans, what was actually happening, um, short-term sales as well as long-term brand equity measures. And we saw very positive results. We actually saw their business improve significantly. They grew you know, larger than the category. And I think that's just one example about um, how to actually apply data to help our clients grow our business. And we have a <laughs> big investment in business science, which is what we call it within Medicom and, and across our, our agency group. And we continue to invest there. And it's, it's one of the big enablers because the more evidence we have of what works and what doesn't work, the, the more we can help our clients to grow their business. Um, it's so good to have uh, David Jumur here again from 24 7 uh, Media. Um, all time, every time I see you, there are so many fancy buzzwords around us, and there are still so many fancy <laughs> buzzwords around us. Uh, you know all of them. Um, do clients understand what agencies are talking about? Well, I'm not an agency, and I don't know what they're talking about. So. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Harvey, my good colleague, 
uh, is very articulate when it comes to talking about objectives and, and strategies. But uh, um, that's a tough question. You know, if, if I had known I was going to be standing up, I would have wore more comfortable shoes. But uh, <laughs> may we help you with that? I, I, uh, you wear your high heels again. Or no, these are the elevator shoes. Okay. Uh, but in any event, we started the company in 1997, and we were an ad network. That's all we were. And uh, we went public on that, just being a website ad network. And today, or I should say over those years, we've had to transform the business many times in order to stay alive and thrive and survive. We went through the, the big run-up, the big bust, we recovered, came back, sold the company at WPP about five years ago, and it's, and it's been great. And I'd like to run a video to show you what we are today from the lowly website network we were in 1997. You brought a little video with you. You're supposed to do the video. Okay. I, I thought I was queuing that. Gonna see David G. Moore's video right now. <coughs> Hold on tight. The internet is the first human enterprise that expands at biologic speed. What is possible doubles every two years. Competitors can come from anywhere. The economics of publishing, media, and advertising undergo rapid decompression. Technologies multiply, causing acronym blindness. There is no pause button. What is your strategy? in a marketplace with no boundaries. What's next for the advertiser, the agency, and the publisher? Our advice? Simplify. Why chase solutions that are always changing? Customer data is the new competitive advantage. What you need is a single view of customers and your market space. Whoever knows your customers best wins. Right now, that's not you. Who's your technology partner? Who helps you navigate constant change? Who simplifies customer data for you and keeps your data your data? It's your future. Who's your technology partner in this evolution? Who will help you simplify? And of course, that would be us. But <laughs> so, what a surprise! Apologize for the the commercial, but I I think it's indicative of the massive change that we've gone through since 1997, from being a web ad say, at a website ad network to now a technology provider and a a DMP. I'm talking about speed, development, transformation. I think the first um, raise in the digital transformation was for faster processors, talking about computers, the second for bandwidth, fixed and mobile. What will be the next race look like? Maybe first uh, Mr. Moore and then Mr. Lim. Well, I think we heard earlier about mobile, uh, video, social. Um, from a, a, a smartphone perspective, I don't know, they're getting to be obsolete about every six months now, so I would say that most of the, the big breakthroughs in the hardware business, if I understood the question properly, are going to be in the tablet and the smartphone. So, oh, it, Without a doubt, it's, it's mobile. I mean, it's mobile is the way that's, uh, I, I think, in certain parts of the world, we're even predicting that the, the desktop will be in the closet in the next 12 months. So, I, I think as much as your brands talk about social strategies and you know, to talk about connecting with consumers. I think the, the next race is really, uh, it's around the platform and making sure that the strategies that everyone's building and the money you're spending also translates into this device and that it can also be properly communicated in the size of the screen. And what's the secret? We're talking about shaping models and creating business. What is the next big step to create more business with that? Well, it, it, you know, it's it's a platform, right? So a mobile device is a platform, and the, the business is what you can do around that. I mean, it, that's it's similar to our business at Spotify, which is, you know, we've got a unique business model in, in the sense that we allow people to listen to free music um, on, on any device uh, they want to. But that's just the first, it, as revolutionary and as amazing as that is, 
It's really what you can do on top of that. It's what brands can do around that experience. It's what third-party developers can do around that experience. And it's really understanding how to take all the content that's out there uh, inside of this platform and make it relevant to consumers. I'm talking about the consumers. Web 2.0 transformed in one way communication into a, a dialogue. By the way, we're still waiting, talking about dialogues for your question. We have some coming up right here. What have you learned from your customers so far talking about dialogue, Mr. Levick? Well, we know that our customers love music and they love to share it. So I think the biggest part that we've learned is just the social nature of music as an object. And, you know, I think that's a lesson you can sort of, while it's, it's not unique to music, it's unique to content in general. Um, just to give an example uh, of, of the magnitude we're talking about, uh, you know, we're, we're heavily integrated in Facebook. Obviously, social is a big part of our business. Uh, it, it, it earlier, uh, earlier this year, in pick, pick, a, pick a month in the spring, we sent 1.5 billion impressions to Facebook in terms of music stories that were generated through Spotify. That 1.5 billion impressions we sent then turned into 50 billion impressions across across Facebook. So it really goes to show the magnitude of how these objects aren't just consumed, but then how they're shared amongst these networks. Uh, I also think that just uh, yeah. I also think that you know what what's happening that's related to mobile is we're operating in a real time world because all you have to do is pull your mobile device out of your pocket and you see what's going on. You see, you can actually even look at it our probably our Twitter feed here to see what yeah. you guys are saying about us. Um, in a real-time so world. Okay. <laughs> so that means we need to be far more responsive, far more quickly than we ever have before. Um, consumers and customers expect that. Um, when we do it right, it works really well because consumers respond. We have um, you know, some case studies where we've seen that our response back to consumers can generate um, you know, sales in real time and it can generate you know, CRM and customer satisfaction in real time. And I think that, that as these platforms develop, and as the content around these platforms improves, and our responses get even better and more relevant, um, you're going to see a lot of growth in our business. And, and we're already seeing it. We've started to transform our organization. We launched something called the MBA um, over the last two years called, uh, you know, it stands for Mediacom Beyond Advertising. And it's basically taking content, taking um, technology, taking data, and putting it together so that we can bring all of the different uh, content devices together and can actually distribute that content over multiple platforms. Before we talk uh, with Mr. Sikalovich about his dialogue with the clients in Russia, uh, Mr. Lecce? Just, just a quick, listen, I think it's really important that we establish, understand, and stay true to our brand essence and voice. And I think brands struggle with this. You see a lot of schizophrenia on Facebook in terms of what the brand represents. Uh, consumers expect us to be uh, consistent uh, genuine, responsive, all of this is easier said than done, and it's not in the comfort zone of most mass marketers, and it takes a lot of di diligence. The most important thing is to really avoid what I sometimes refer to as the conversational divide, where we have this sense of openness on platforms like Facebook, but channels like customer service or contact us have a don't talk to me sign wrapped around their neck. And we have to be consumers see one brand, and that means it's more than a marketing challenge. It's also an operational challenge. And I would say for some brands, get it consistent before you go out and make promises that you can't keep. Talking about uh, consumers, talking about devices, here's another question uh, for Mr. DeVard. Uh, coming up from the audience, from Eric Bruckner. Question to Ford. If people still check products on mobile at the store, why there are no iPads at Ford stores? Well, that means that you should go to a Ford dealership very quickly because we were the first to introduce iPads, albeit only about 12 months ago. Uh, I think that's exactly what needs to happen. Uh, and what we're doing now is we're also linking uh, brick and mortar with online. And so when the customers at home configure their ideal vehicle, you get to the dealership, go on the iPad, you retrieve that configuration, and you talk to the salesperson and say, well, actually, I've done my homework, and now let's talk about test driving it. Um, now we're talking about uh, what's going on in Russia, what is, for us, uh, of course, very, very interesting for the first time we got you here. Um, maybe we talk about um, mobile, we talk about the, the, the Neftech license. Um, what is the benefit of the Neftec license for your mobile business? Uh, well, it's our uh, international plans. We are going uh, abroad in Russia. We have some uh, 
business in Turkey, as you know, and uh, trying to get some other uh, countries. And uh, this is an important part of uh, our offering, where even Russian users can go outside of Russia using these uh, worldwide names that not take license to us. And what are your plans for the future? Are you really still focusing on Russia, or are you maybe a big, big challenge in a few years for this uh, little company called Google? <laughs> We, uh, we kind of uh, base our main business in Russia, of course, but uh, we see and we try to explore different models, uh, including mobile, and I have some examples here, uh, three or four business, three businesses that I brought as an example that we uh, grow uh, out of our main search business, and we're trying to grow these models uh, pretty much inside Russia, but we're also looking at the outside world and trying to see what, uh, what we can do. Uh, uh, in the countries where 99% of the search traffic coming through one search engine that we think maybe um, there is a chance uh, to give these people another opportunity and uh, that might be very interesting. A lot of people have a special look when they look about Russia, the political situation. Are you maybe responsible for the next revolution in Russia? Me personally. <laughs> and your team maybe. Well, personally, I would love to be responsible for that, but uh, I mean, in a peaceful way, of course. <laughs> and how could but uh, I think yeah. uh, the company work uh, as a technology company. We we are very neutral. We are not for uh, for government or, or against government. We, are, we stay very neutral. And, uh, and um, if you compare your market, let me say, with the uh, Chinese market and the U.S. market and the European market, what's special with Yandex in Russia? Again, uh, nothing super special except that we are better uh, than our <laughs> <laughs> well, But what is better? Just uh, for, the, for the Russian consumers? Well, uh, how, how do you get really a new wait, No, this is an example that I, I was going to tell us. You know, it's a huge number of is it more than bullets here. But uh, basically, for example, this is uh, the ultimate shopping uh, we created for Russian users. Uh, we started about 12 years ago. I personally did uh, that project. and. Uh, we, 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 as a search engine, we don't, we don't want to be a shopping site, right? So we started to aggregate and add value to that. And now we have lots of services and people, up to 20% of all the orders come through our system. And 50% uh, of uh, Moscow uh, users uh, use our system and 16 million users monthly and so on. I mean, lots of beautiful numbers, but basically this is the ultimate shopping uh, system and platform that we created in Russia and I think uh, this is what makes us different. Uh, this is a very fine example uh, why why we are different. I don't know about Google having similar stuff anywhere else. Okay. Um, most of the people nowadays are online. How hard will it be to convince the rest? <coughs> Who wants to have that question? <laughs> it's, it's not online. It's not online. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's clearly an emerging wealth. And, and you see that the number of people coming online are, you know, coming online quickly in markets where um, the economies are growing very quickly. Um, especially young people are are um, becoming economically much better off, and and they're moving online in in rapid places. So you tend to see the biggest growth um, totally consistent with economic development. You see it in Asia, you see it in, uh, in Latin America, and, and you're going to continue to see that for the foreseeable future. One of the things we work on is how do we help clients reach out to the next billion consumers. I think your point about mobile is, is, is right on. You're going to see in many of these markets, and you've probably seen it already in some, that, that mobile will, will um, supersede tethered internet access very quickly, it already has, and a lot of people are just going to go right to the mobile device. Every, every, everybody is on, has a mobile phone today, so arguably there's just about everybody's online, and I think that counts. What I think is a very interesting dynamic that's occurring that has never happened before, and that is the old saying of there's only 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, and if online, consumption is going up, it's got to be coming from somewhere. And that, to a certain extent, continues to be true. However, it's being tempered by the fact that consumers are now multitasking. So they're watching TV while they're looking at their mobile phone or, or playing with their tablet or, or on their laptop. And I think that delivers a very difficult challenge for the advertiser because 
you're working your smartphone, you're watching TV, what, you got to roadblock the two of those to get the message across? Is the message actually diluted because there's two things going on at that time? And then add to that screen size, right? If you have a big screen in your living room and you buy, you see a commercial for TV versus you see the same commercial on your, your smartphone or on a smaller device, is there a dilution in impact? It would seem that bigger, bigger ad would be more impact, smaller ad be less impact. Um, these are things we haven't even started to measure yet. And I think that's going to make things even more complicated than they've been so far. I, I think the age of digital roadblocks is over. And we just need to accept that and move on to a different, a different world. And this is, what, this is like the greatest gift that social media has brought us. For many of us, it's been a rude awakening. But it's teaching us that you know, the most effective form of advertising is not the stuff that slaps consumers in the face. And we're going to have to new, learn a new form. And I do think the industry got started on a bad track. Because we concluded that the way you get a consumer attention is to block and tackle and interrupt. And they rejected us in droves. And the key thing for us as leaders of the industry is to make sure that we do not repeat those mistakes of the past. Let's take these lessons that consumers are giving us for free vis-a-vis -vis the social channels and develop a win-win ad model. I mean, I think the biggest takeaway with that, and we talked about where it's going, it's really about context and content for brands to think about, is that it, brands now have to think about the right context of where to put the message, and also think about their brand as content as well. It, it, it's exactly right. You can't, you, can, you can't just put your brand in and flash it in someone's face anymore and be relevant. You have, to be, you have to not just be part of the conversation, you have to also know when it's relevant to be in the conversation, when it's relevant to not be in the conversation. These things all work together. Um, you know, we see when we put a TV ad on, we see more people searching brands or searching certain brand terms. We see people who um, are, are more socially engaged. So it's not about digital, it's not about uh, non-digital. It's really about how these things work together. We all live in the digital world, but we spend our time uh, both on and off digital platforms and, and understanding how these work together to enhance brand preference, enhance sales, make consumers' lives easier and, and help consumers is, is what our job is, um, and we have to architect those things. Uh, there's so much brand new technique around us here, but there is no technique uh, to uh, stop the ticking clock because we are already <laughs> over time, sorry for that. Um, we have uh, some few other Twitter questions, but uh, nothing which is really a new window, so please, um, sorry that we are already out of time. I know there's so much expertise here on the panel, we cannot present everything right here, but to get a first impression, uh, we try to go into the digital transformation right here. But let me ask you maybe at the end, you want to have a photo? Yeah, yeah. You got it already, thank you. Um, we start with, start with Mr. Segalovich as uh, maybe a little um, a resume of that, um, talking about the digital transformation, the next big thing will. Well, I think uh, commoditization of very complex technologies and uh, into the mobile and uh, the cloud. I think that will be changing uh, everyday life and, of course, uh, uh, shape new models. David J. Moore. Uh, I think uh, location-based advertising on mobile smartphones is um, going to be the next really big business. Harvey Goldhertz. Uh, I'd say two areas. Content. You know, the barrier to producing content is very low today. Every one of us can produce it. We just saw Pete do it. And, and, and the barrier to distributing content is also very low. You don't have to be a big TV station to distribute. And that's fundamentally changing what we do. We are, we are in the business of creating and distributing content that helps people to consume, helps people to improve their lives. And if we do that, we'll all be successful. Chad Levin. Uh, I, the biggest is it's youth, actually. I mean, I think that it's, it's the next generation who doesn't know any of the things we're talking about and doesn't even use the same words we're talking about in digital and broadcast. It's, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing coming, is understanding how the youth will interact with uh, all of this as they continue to shape our industry. Grant of art. For us, uh, the next big thing is uh, something called SYNC, uh, which is uh, in-car connectivity. <coughs> And what I think is going to be really interesting for the industry is that we chose for an open platform, which means that there's a whole new world of apps uh, opening up 
for everybody to come up for the creativity of everyone in this room and outside uh, to say how can we provide content while driving. I think the big idea is meaningful content and services. I think we're in the business to serve, uh, not just advertise to consumers, and I think that's where the winners are going to go. I'm going to make a photo of you with a panel. What do you think about that? All right. You with your best friends at Cologne. Had a nice two days. That's fine. Okay. That's good. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, for right now for this first panel right here. And uh, next on stage will be uh, Martin Mayagosna with the brand perception and the value of social marketing right here in a few minutes. Um, it's losing the house to get. This is for you. Thank you so much for coming along. From the US, from everywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you.